Good morning, everyone. So I'm hoping now that people can hear me and see me. And we're going to carry on with our reading of Friedrich and the Young Volk. We're going to start with the chapter, The Young Volk, um, which is 1933. And things certainly take a dramatic turn here. Good morning, everyone. I ran down the stairs. At the front door, I pressed the Schneider's bell. Three times short, once long. That was our signal. Then I sauntered through the front garden, past Polycarp and walked to the corner. Friedrich arrived almost at once. Thanks a lot, he said breathlessly. Thanks so much for fetching me. Side by side, we walked in the direction of the park. We were early and didn't have to hurry. I'm so glad, you know, Friedrich began afresh. But you mustn't tell my father. He doesn't like my going there. <clears throat> you know, I saw you all marching through town with your flag and singing. I think that's really great. I'd love to take far part, but father won't let me join the young Volk. Still, maybe he'll change his mind after a while. <clears throat> we ambled through the park, through the, through the trees. We could make out the brown brick buildings of the old fortress. What's on for today? said Friedrich. More war games? I shook my head. Wednesdays are club nights. We can bring strangers only on Wednesdays. But you'd better not mention right away that you're a Jew. Friedrich put his arm around my shoulder and whispered to himself, Oh, I'm so pleased. Our squad leader's a great fellow, I told him. He's been a member for ages. You can see his neckerchief pinned to the wall of the clubhouse. It has a cut right through the middle. He wore it during a raid. A communist tried to stab him, but his knife only cut the cloth and he wasn't harmed. Friedrich fished around in his trouser pocket. I almost forgot about this, <clears throat> he shouted, pulling out a black three-cornered scarf. I swiped it from Mother's first aid box, he said, smiling. We stopped at the next park bench and I showed Friedrich how to roll his scarf according to regulations. And then I placed it underneath his white shirt collar so that only a corner hung out in the back. <clears throat> I was just about to tie a knot in front when, when Friedrich pulled out a ring from his trouser pocket. It was made of brown leather and had a swastika stamped on it. Not even our squad leader owns such a grand ring. Friedrich proudly slid the ring over the rolled ends of the triangular scarf all the way up to his neck. And when he saw how I envied him, his ring, he was still more delighted. He pushed out his chest, fell into step with me, and together we marched through the old fortress gate to the parade grounds. The others were already in the courtyard, but they didn't pay any attention to us. Most of them wore short pants and only striped or checked shirts. Only a few owned the regulation brown shirt. Strictly speaking, no one was properly dressed. The only thing everyone had in common was the triangular neckerchief with the corner showing below the shirt collar in black. With shining eyes, Friedrich leaned against the wall beside me. I'm so glad I'm here, he said, touching his neckerchief ring. My platoon leader arrived at last. He was about 15 and wore the regula regulation uniform we all longed for. I reported that I'd bought a new boy. In order, he said. But I don't have time now. We'll take care of it later. Then he ordered us to fall in line. We fell in line. I pushed Friedrich into the back row next to me. Right, sir, um, close it up, single file. There was some confusion because Friedrich didn't quite know how to march in single file and he, he got a few jabs in his ribs before he, he stamped behind me up the narrow winding stairs. Our clubhouse was a windowless room in the old fortress. A strong bulb dangled from the ceiling by two wires. Entering, one's eyes met the picture of Adolf Hitler on the wall facing the door. And underneath the picture, our squad leader's famous scarf was stretched full width. The many fingers that had reverently passed over the fabled cut had widened it to a hole so large you could stick your head through it. On the right wall hung two crossed poles, their black pennants fastened with pins on the wall. The white embroidered victory ruin, sign of the Jungvolk, 
looked resplendent in the centre of the black pennant. Resplendent means uh, wonderful. On the wall beside the door, a platoon leader had tried his hand at maxims in watercolour. Be more than you seem, was one. And the second read, fight for your life. Friedrich shivered with excitement as he sat down beside me on the wooden bench. Great, he whispered. I'm so glad I'll be joining the young Volk and become a pimp. We had hardly sat down when my platoon leader bellowed, Attention! Everyone jumped up and stood facing Hitler's picture. The platoon leader spoke to our squad leader. With heavy tread, our squad leader stepped beneath the picture. He lifted his hand. Sieg Heil, boys! Sieg Heil, Fallen Führer, we replied. Friedrich shouted it with such enthusiasm, his voice broke and tears came into his eyes. Sit down, ordered the squad leader, and above the din of dropping onto the benches, he began, boys, I brought someone special to our club evening tonight. He is special delegate Galco from the district office of our party. He wants to talk to you about something very important. Only then did I notice the hunchback. He was so short, he didn't stand out among the boys. He was covered from head to toe in brown. He even wore brown boots. The visor of his cap, also brown, hid his face. He walked to the front, but he couldn't see the whole room. And in the end, the platoon commander bought an empty orange crate. The hunchback climbed onto it and began his speech. Pimps of our Führer. The voice was unpleasantly shrill. I have been delegated to talk to you today about the Jews. You all know Jews. But you all know too little about them. This will be different an hour from now. You will then know what a danger Jews represent for us and our nation. Friedrich sat, bent slightly forward beside me on his bench. His eyes hung on the speaker, his mouth slightly open. He devoured every word. The hunchback seemed to feel this, and soon it looked as if he were addressing his speech to Friedrich alone. His words were effective. He was able to paint everything in such colours that we believed it was actually happening before our eyes. What he now told us made even those with colds forget to cough. With a large knife, he said, a knife as long as my arm. The Jew priest steps beside the poor cow. Very slowly, he raises his knife. The beast feels the threat of death. It bellows, tries to wrench free, but the Jew knows no mercy. Quick as a flash, he drives the wide knife into the animal's neck. Blood spurts, it befouls everything. The animal is in a frenzy, its eyes fixed, staring in horror, but the Jew knows no pity. He doesn't shorten its suffering. He wallows in the pain of the bleeding animal. He wants the blood and he stands by and watches the animal slowly bleeding to its pitiful death. It's called kosher butchering. The God of the Jews demands it. Friedrich bent so far forward. I was afraid he'd topple off the bench. His face was pale. His breathing laboured. His hands clutched at his knees. The hunchback told of murdered Christian children, of, of Jewish crimes, of wars. Just listening made me shudder. Finally, the speaker ended. One sentence. One sentence only want to hammer into your brains. I will repeat it until it comes out of your ears and repeat it. The Jews are our affliction. And again, 
The Jews are our affliction. And another time, the Jews are our affliction. Sweating and exhausted, the little special delegate stood on his orange box. It was completely quiet in the room. Then the hunchback pointed to Friedrich. What is the sentence? He asked him. Friedrich didn't move. What is the sentence? The speaker asked more sharply. Friedrich sat stiffly and hunched forward beside me on the bench. What is the sentence? The voice of the special delegate cracked. He hopped off the box and walked towards Friedrich with pointed finger. Friedrich swallowed. The hunchback stood before him. His eyes stabbed at Friedrich. He grabbed his scarf and slowly pushed the ring upwards. What is the sentence? In a faint voice, Friedrich said, The Jews, the Jews are our affliction. The hunchback hauled Friedrich up from the bench in one movement. Stand up when I talk to you, he screamed in his face, and replied loudly, if you please. Friedrich stood up straight. He was still pale. In a clear voice, he proclaimed, The Jews are our affliction. There wasn't a sound. Friedrich turned around. The ring was in the hunchback's hand. Friedrich left the club unhindered. I stayed where I was. So we see in this chapter perhaps how these ideas are inculcated, are, are brought home to, um, to Germans in, 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 in this situation, in the Young Volk. And these, these propaganda lies are spread or distorted um, to make the Jews seem worse than they were. And as you can imagine, for innocent young boys um, growing up in something like the Young Volk, which is probably in many ways similar to the scouting movement that we would have here, um, and people they trust and admire and respect are, are putting across these messages um, to distort their views of, of uh, the Jewish people and, and, and the Jewish faith. And you can see how that that propaganda war starts to be waged um, across that period in Nazi Germany. So we'll read on. The Bull, 1933. We ran along the street. Friedrich kept close to the houses and I stayed on the curb. I threw the little rubber ball I'd been given in the shoe store. It hit the centre of the sidewalk and bounced high. Friedrich caught it and threw it back to me. My father will be home at any moment, he called to me. I, I must get back soon. We're going shopping today. Maybe someone will give me a ball too. I nodded and jumped over a manhole. I waited until a pedestrian had gone by and then hurled the ball back to Friedrich. Friedrich hadn't been watching. There was a crash. The ball rolled harmlessly back to me. <clears throat> Friedrich stared open-mouthed at the smash shop window. I bent to pick up the ball, not yet believing what had happened. Suddenly, the woman stood before us. She grabbed Friedrich's arm and began to screech. Doors and windows opened. A crowd gathered. Thieves! Burglars! The woman shouted. Her husband stood by the shop door, hands in his pockets, smoking a pipe. This good-for-nothing Jew boy here broke my shop window! She told everyone who cared to listen. He wants to rob me. She turned to Friedrich. But you didn't quite make it this time, did you? Because I'm always watching. I know you. You won't get away from me. You pack of Jews. They should get rid of you. First you ruin our businesses with your department stores. Then you rob us on top of it. Just you wait. Hitler will show you yet. And she shook Friedrich violently. But he didn't do it. I yelled. I, I threw the ball. I, I broke your window. We didn't want to steal. The woman looked at me, eyes large and stupid. Her mouth 
dropped open. Her husband had swept the broken glass into the gutter. He collected the rolls of thread, the stars of black and white yarn, the balls of colourful embroidery, yarn from the display case, and carried them into the shop. The woman's eyes grew very small. How dare you interfere? What are you doing here anyway? Away with you! You don't think you have to protect this rotten Jew boy? Because you're living in the same house, do you? Go on, beat it! But I threw the ball, I said again. The woman lunged at me without letting go of Friedrich. Friedrich cried. He wiped tears on his sleeve, smearing his whole face. Someone had called the police. Out of breath and sweating, a policeman arrived on a bicycle. He asked the woman to tell him what had happened. Again, she told the story of the attempted burglary. I tugged at his sleeve. Uh, officer, I said. He didn't do it. I broke the pane with my ball. The woman looked at me threateningly. Don't you believe him, officer, she said. He only wants to protect the Jew boy here. Don't you believe him? He thinks the Jew's his friend because they live in the same house. The policeman bent down to me. You don't understand this yet. You're still too young, he explained. You may think you are doing him a favour by standing up for him. But you know he's a Jew. Believe me, we grown-ups have had plenty of experience with Jews. You can't trust them. They're sneaky and they cheat. This woman was the only one who saw what happened, so... But she didn't see it, I interrupted him. Only I was there and I did it. <clears throat> the policeman frowned. You wouldn't try to call this woman a liar. I wanted to explain, but... He didn't let me. He took Friedrich's wrist from the woman and led him towards our house, followed by the woman and a long line of curious onlookers. I joined the line. Halfway there, we ran into Herr Schneider. Sobbing, Friedrich shouted, Father! Astonished, Herr Schneider surveyed the procession. He came closer and said hello and looked from one person to another, obviously puzzled. Your son, said the policeman. But the woman didn't give him a chance to go on. In one burst, she repeated her tales. The only part she left out this time was her insinuation about Jews. Herr Schneider listened patiently. And when she had finished, he took Friedrich's chin in his hand and lifted his head so he could see into his eyes. Friedrich? He asked seriously. Did you break the shop window intentionally? Friedrich shook his head, still sobbing. I, I did it, Herr Schneider. I, I threw the ball, but I didn't do it on purpose. And I showed him my small rubber ball. Friedrich nodded. Herr Schneider took a deep breath. If you can swear, on oath, that what you just told me is the truth, he told the woman. Go ahead and register a formal complaint. You know me. You know where I live. The woman did not reply. Herr Schneider pulled out his purse. Kindly release my son, officer, he said sharply. I will pay for the damage at once. Conversations on the Stairs, 1933. Herr Schneider and Friedrich were coming down the stairs. I could see them through the crack in the door. Herr Schneider was dragging his weight up the steps by holding onto the banister. And on the landing outside our door, he stopped to catch his breath. There they all met. Herr Schneider said hello and was about to go on. Herr Resch did not return the greeting. He blocked Herr Schneider's way. He breathed heavily. His face turned red. Finally, he burst out. <clears throat> I want to talk to you. Herr Schneider said, certainly. 
and made a small bow to Herr Resch. He took the keys from his pockets. May I ask you to step into my apartment, Herr Resch? I believe it is easier to talk in the living room than on the stairs. With a gesture of his hand, he offered Herr Resch precedence. Herr Resch refused. Never again will I set foot in your apartment, he said. I am just glad I met you here. Where there is to do, what there is to discuss can be settled here. Herr Schneider cleared his throat, made another slight bow and said, just as you wish, Herr Resch. Herr Resch took his time. He, he shuffled as far as our door and pressed the bell. Father opened the door and I peered out from behind him. Would you please listen in, Herr Resch asked my father. I need you as a witness. Father stayed in the doorway without saying a word. Puzzled, he looked from Herr Resch to Herr Schneider and back. Herr Schneider looked at my father and shrugged. Friedrich clung anxiously to the banister. Herr Resch took a deep breath. He coughed <clears throat> one more time, breathed deeply. I hereby give you notice for the first, he finally spluttered. No one said a word. Only Herr Resch's excited, gasping breaths were audible. Father's and Herr Schneider's eyes locked together. Herr Resch lowered his eyes to the floor. Friedrich examined the stairs, stair lights and I understood nothing. I, I beg your pardon, said Herr Schneider. You move out on the first, declared Herr Resch. Herr Schneider smiled and he said, you, you can't be serious, Herr Resch. But you can't do that, Herr Resch, my father interjected. Herr Schneider has his rights as a tenant. Herr Resch shot a mean glance at my father. I didn't ask you to support this gentleman, he snapped. You are supposed to be a witness, nothing else. My father cleared his throat. You cannot order me to be quiet, Herr Resch. Do not count on me as a witness. He pushed me back and slammed the door. But we stayed behind it to listen. Politely, Herr Schneider took the conversation up again. It really isn't done to give me such short and unexpected notice, Herr Resch. Pretending to cough, Herr Resch replied, <clears throat> You will see, it can be done. Herr Schneider inquired, and may I ask why you are giving me notice? So loud that it reverberated through the whole house. Herr Resch's shout was, Because you are a Jew! We heard him stamp down the stairs. So if you wanted to do some reading around this uh, now, it would be really good to perhaps go on to um, Google or a search engine and look up what happens in Germany. Is laws, lots of laws are passed and changed and things are going on politically um, from 1931 through to 1939. And, and as life gets more complicated and more difficult for the Jewish people um, in, that, in that sort of Hitler's rise to power. And, and as a little sort of research to the context of the novel that we're, we're reading together, it would be really interesting for you um, to, to have a read about that. If you have the original book, at the back of the book, there is um, a list of dates and law changes and things that happen. And what I will ask um, Mrs. Chima to do is to take copies of those, those pages at the back and add them to Shobi so that you can, you can read around some of those things. So I hope you've enjoyed um, our little reading session this morning. Apologies if there are any technical difficulties. I am coming to terms with it. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing hopefully some of you at the food bank tomorrow. So take care and we'll be back here at 9.30 again tomorrow.